let's, let's talk a little about the history of uh, the DSM. I mean, here we are tonight. This book has caused a lot of controversy. And there was plenty of controversy before this book. It's, it's kind of shocking to me, really, when one thinks about the hegemony of, uh, of the American Psychiatric Association and uh, the DSM for this kind of trouble um, to be uh, brewing is really surprising and uh, a relief to me. And uh, I, um, and so I think we should start kind of with that in mind and for me to ask Gary um, if he could talk a little about the history of the DSM, why it became so important and powerful, and, uh, and then we'll probably hear from him a bit later about what's happening now. Okay, well, you can blame it on representative democracy because uh, the DSM was originally, the, the, the job of counting and sorting the mentally disordered uh, fell to uh, doctors uh, in 1840 when the Census Bureau worried that what they called at the time the insane weren't getting adequate representation in Congress, um, although now they are well represented in Congress. <laughs> uh, were asked, uh, the doctors were asked to enumerate them because doctors were the people who knew where they were, either in the insane asylums or hidden away in people's homes. And that function developed over the course of the 19th century and in the 20th century, uh, by then, it, the American Psychiatric Association had taken on its modern name. It was originally known as the Association of Superintendents of American Hospitals, uh, American Institutions for the Insane. It had become the American Psychiatric Association, and they added to the counting the sorting. And they did that um, sort of free of charge uh, until the 1950s at which point they codified what they had come up with in what was called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, now known as DSM-1. And the, uh, the manual's gone through five different editions. This is the fifth one coming out next week. Uh, it's owned by the American Psychiatric Association. They uh, exercise intellectual property rights over it. They charge $150 or $200 for the book. And the... Uh, thrust of the book, the thing that you have to understand about it is that while the DSM is owned privately, it is a tremendous public trust. The DSM is known, of course, if you've ever been in therapy or had contact with the mental health apparatus, uh, you get a diagnosis. The diagnosis comes from the DSM, but it has much more profound implications. The DSM controls research. To get research approved by the National Institute of Health, it helps a lot to tie it to a DSM uh, diagnosis. It also controls drug research to get a drug approved by the FDA. It really helps to have it tied to a DSM diagnosis. It controls special education uh, uh, expenditure because it helps to have a DSM diagnosis to get special ed services for your kid. It controls what goes on in the courts because, of course, there are competency, tri uh, competency determinations and sentencing evaluations and so on. So it is profoundly important in ways that are invisible. And it's privately controlled. It's sort of the, f the ultimate in privatization. It's mm. unparalleled in medicine. This is the only, uh, the only field in which it happens. And what's important to remember there is one of the reasons for that is because nobody else wants to do it. You know, if somebody else did, they might have some competition. But really, nobody else wants to do it. And the reason for that is because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to determine what a mental illness is. Nobody's ever figured it out, including the American Psychiatric Association. So in a way, although I'm sure we'll have plenty of critical things to say about the APA tonight, we do have to understand something, which is that they're swimming in uncharted waters. They're trying to chart them, but they're not able to. That's not really their fault, because the idea that we can get to, first of all, a definition of mental illness, and secondly, an understanding of how it works and what causes it and what to do about it, 
that's a tremendous challenge. And the people whose hands that challenge has been put into happen to be the American Psychiatric Association. You said something nice there about them. My mother always said, <laughs> if you have to say something mean, say something nice first. <laughs> well, uh, your, so your historical frame um, has uh, taken us a little ways. Um, I'd like to just mention something about psychologists and others in relation to this, because you know, the DSM is, uh, has to be used by every uh, licensed clinician if they're going to um, uh, be reimbursed uh, by insurance companies um, or if they're working in a clinic or a hospital. And so this, uh, the reach of the DSM is far beyond just psychiatry. Every therapist um, has to deal with it in some way. And I'm thinking especially of my doctoral students um, who um, have to wrestle with some of these uh, philosophical issues that Gary's book brings up. Um, and so I want to say a word or two about psychology as a field. You know, psychologists weren't therapists until after World War II. Um, in 1949, there was a conference in Boulder, Colorado called the Boulder Conference. And um, at that time, the federal government uh, made a, uh, an offer that the field of psychology couldn't, felt like it couldn't turn down. And that was they could get a lot of federal money to uh, train uh, uh, clinical psychologists, which had never happened before. Um, and um, they jumped at the chance because of the money, and it totally changed psychology as a field. The problem is they, uh, part of the agreement was that they would um, train psychologists in VA hospitals uh, under the uh, guidance, let us say, of, of, um, of psychiatrists. And so the medicalization of psychotherapy became uh, institutionalized at that time. And uh, psychologists, social workers, family therapists, mental health uh, counselors have uh, been in a, a serious uh, bind uh, ever since that time. And that bind uh, continues to this day is really what, um, in, in some aspects, this, the controversy about the DSM-5 is about. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me just add to that. You, you know, it's, if you go back even farther to 1926, which was when the New York Psychoanalytic Society decided that psychoanalysis could only be practiced by psychiatrists, an assertion yeah. that Freud was f absolutely livid about. Freud actually said, look, medical education is the worst possible training for a therapist. It encourages doctors to think they can cure stuff and to think about human suffering in the same way that they think about endocrinology. That was the example he used. Um, however, the New York Psychoanalytic won. And in a way, the DSM is the bastard offspring of mm. this love of marriage between mm. therapy and medicine. And it, it does have this uh, effect of forcing, I suppose, if you want to play victim, uh, clinicians to uh, use it. But let, let me read you something about this from the Book of Woe. Um, so we all have to make a diagnosis, and what happens is that um, every therapist uh, comes up with their favorites. Uh, at the top of my favorites list is 309.28, which stands for Adjustment Disorder with Mixed Anxiety and Depressed Mood. Here's how the dsm 4 defines it. A, the development of emotional or behavioral symptoms in response to an identifiable stressor occurring within three months of the onset of the stressor. B, these symptoms or behaviors are clinically significant as evidenced by either of the following. One, marked distress that is in excess of what would be expected from exposure to the stressor. Two, significant impairment in social or occupational academic functioning. I won't go on, you get the idea. A clinician takes these five criteria, there are five, and if the patient meets them, they, uh, they give them the diagnosis. Of course, nobody really does that. 
what we really do is we just say, well, this label uh, will fit. You can see, though, why 309.28 would be popular with clinicians and why insurance company claims examiners probably see it all the time. It sounds innocuous, which makes it go down easy with patients. And with employers or insurers or others who might have occasion to scrutinize a patient's medical history and be put off by a more serious sounding diagnosis. It offers all kinds of diagnostic flexibility. Take criterion B1, for instance. That's the one about the marked distress that is in excess of what would be expected. It is easy to meet. It is easy enough to use the fact that the patient made an appointment as evidence of marked distress. <laughs> and once they've made the appointment and been there, then they will have the marked distress, <laughs> if, if you do your job right. And that lovely parenthetical in criterion E, which is once the stressor or its consequences has terminated, makes it, uh, then, then you, have an, you, you can re-up the diagnosis every six months. Uh, so you can say that now the psychosocial stressor is the suffering the patient had. But adjustment disorder also has a special place in my heart because it was my own first diagnosis, or at least the first one I knew about. I got it sometime in the early 1980s when I was in my early 20s and the DSM was in its third edition. I don't remember why I wanted to be in therapy or very much of what I talked about with my therapist. I do remember that my father was paying for it. He was probably hoping I would discover that my self-chosen circumstances, living alone in a cabin in the woods without the modern conveniences, were a symptom of something that could be cured. What I was being treated for, however, was not back to the land disorder or <laughs> why don't you grow up already disorder, but rather as I discovered one day when I glanced down at my statement on, my recept on the receptionist's desk, adjustment disorder. I guess the tag seemed about right. I definitely wasn't adjusting. And if it occurred to me that by calling my lifestyle an illness, my therapist had passed judgment on exactly where the problem resided, I didn't think much of it at the time. But I do remember that I noticed for the first time that I'd been going to these weekly appointments in a doctor's office. It happened to be in a building adjacent to the office of my childhood pediatrician. But it did not smell like alcohol or have a white-shoed woman bustling about, nor did its business seem even a bit related to the shots and probes I'd suffered next door. So the discord stood out, but still, the fact of that diagnosis, right there in black and white, was undeniable. I was a mental patient. I was eventually cured of my maladjustment, not by therapy, but by a family coup that resulted in my grandfather's being relieved of the farm he'd inherited from his mother. That happened to be the land on which I'd built my home, and so I was evicted. My cabin eventually bulldozed, and the land converted to McMansions, and it became necessary for me to earn a living. Of the many adjustments I have had to make, diagnosing people in order to secure an income was one of the strangest. <laughs> Not only because the DSM's label seems so insufficient, its criteria so deracinated, the whole proce procedure so banal in comparison with the rich and disturbing and ultimately inexhaustible conversation that was occurring in my office, but also, and much more importantly, because of the bad faith involved, I didn't mind colluding with my patients against the insurance companies. Sometimes I actually enjoyed the thought. I brought them in on the scam, explaining exactly what diagnosis I was giving them, sometimes even taking down the book and reading the criteria and occasionally offering them a choice. <laughs> but the fact that we were sharing the lie didn't make our business any less dishonest. Now, I know therapists who diagnose everyone with adjustment disorder, unless the insurance company limits benefits for its treatment on the grounds that it wasn't enough of an illness to warrant much treatment, at which point the patient often contracts a sudden case of something much worse, <laughs> like major depressive disorder. Myself, I prefer to mix things up a little, but mostly I prefer not to do business with the insurance companies, so I often don't have to bother with such dilemmas. Of course, that means I get paid less money, since not everyone can afford my rates without a little help from their friends at Aetna. So I end up giving people a break in return for steering clear of the whole unsavory business. Over the 30 years I've been in practice, I've probably left a couple million dollars on the table by avoiding the DSM. It's an expensive habit, but I think of it as buying my way out of bad faith. And it's not just my rank and file colleagues and I who think of the DSM as if it were a mere, as if it were a colonoscopy, a necessary evil, something to be endured and quickly forgotten, and surely not to be taken seriously unless you have to. I once asked a psychiatrist and former president of the American Psychiatric Association to tell me how the DSM was helpful in his daily practice. Actually, I went around and asked everybody this question. I felt like Diogenes in uh, <laughs> Athens. 
I have a patient I've been seeing for two months, he told me. And my secretary said, what's the diagnosis? I thought a lot about it because I hadn't really formulated it. Then I began to think, what were her symptoms? What does she do? How does she behave? I diagnosed her with obsessive compulsive disorder. Did this change the way you treated her? I asked, no. So what was its value, would you say? I got paid. It is at least ironic that a profession once dedicated to the pursuit of psychological truth is now dependent on this kind of dishonesty for its survival. But I suppose that any system guided by the invisible hand, financial markets, no more than healthcare financing, is bound to be gamed. And the DSM, whatever its flaws, has proved to be a superb playbook. Wow. Now, there is a way that the DSM uh, has a salutary effect on anxiety, I'd say. I see it every year in my students um, when they're confronted by what they're going to have to do, sit in a room with another person, and they always want to know what to do. It's pretty daunting. And uh, so ideas about um, the medicalization of uh, therapy, I, the idea that you can look in a book and find a diagnosis, and then the idea that the diagnosis will tell you what to do is um, anxiety reducing uh, for, um, for the field uh, of psychotherapy. Um, although that's not usually what it's uh, billed to be. Um, uh, you mean it's not billed as an anti-anxiety agent? For therapists. They have to go through FDA. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's probably why they don't mention it then, yeah, but it then, certainly is then, strong. Then they would have to uh, get it into clinical trials and see, yeah, but and have it, a control group. That's right. But it works at first. Um, and I would think that one of the things I hope we can uh, talk about tonight is, is um, when it stops working um, to uh, soothe the anxiety of, uh, of a therapist. Uh, so talk to us a little about some of the, the controversies within DSM-5. Yeah, so here's what happens. So every time a DSM is put to bed, so to speak, all of the controversies get, hit, get locked up, like, like put under amber. And then they revise it, and they open it up. And it hits the air, and it proliferates. And whatever hap was, was locked in there comes out in a whole new era. It's been 20 years since the DSM-4. And what has come out have been a couple of things. I'll talk about two of them. One of them is a problem that occurred in the 90s and, and the early zeros, I guess we call them, um, <laughs> the noughts or the aughts, uh, which was that children started to get diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Now, this is a scandal of major proportions. There's no scandal in my book except this one. And this is not, I'm not original reporting. Uh, a professor at Harvard, a key opinion leader, uh, d decided that children who showed a particularly uh, extreme form of what we might call attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, were really not ADHD kids. They had bipolar disorder. The problem was they didn't have manic episodes. Well, bipolar disorder without manic episodes is like, I don't know, Aunt Jemima's pancakes without a syrup. It just doesn't make any sense. And however, he convinced his field that childhood children's irritability was the same thing as adults, it was like the childhood version of mania. And having convinced people of this, and the, the DSM has this wonderful uh, quality, wonderful uh, opportunity, it has what are called NOS diagnoses, not otherwise specified. They were able to diagnose these kids with bipolar disorder, not otherwise specified, and put them on antipsychotic drugs. Now, this was really disquieting to many people, including many psychiatrists, because these are powerful drugs. They've never really been clinically tested on children. They have substantial side effects, including obesity and diabetes, not to mention what, who knows what they're doing to the child's brain. And so they decided to create a new diagnosis called Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder, DMDD. First, it was called Tempered Dysregulation Disorder. But uh, the word temper seemed to minimize it. So what the APA did when it heard that people didn't like diagnoses was it changed the names 
uh, it's like, like focus grouping and the, you know, if the mouth feel wasn't quite right, they fixed it. So they turned it into this more scientific sounding DMDD and it is gonna be in the DSM-5. Now, whether or not that's actually gonna solve the problem, nobody really knows. These kids now have a new diagnostic home, you know, and, but there's nothing to stop them from being prescribed antipsychotic drugs for that either. So it's possible that that will turn out to be uh, like swallowing a spider uh, to kill a fly. Every, everybody know this? I've said this before, the, the lady that swallows the spider to kill the fly, you know, to solve a problem by creating another problem. Uh, another controversy arose when they decided to delete Asperger's syndrome from the DSM, which is a tremendously uh, controversial move because, well, the, the Asperger's disorder came in in 1994. So in the last 20 years, there's, I'm sure you're aware, been a huge epidemic. It's gone from zero to <laughs> many people. And uh, this has fed uh, this perception that there's a huge increase in uh, autism because Asperger's is related to autism. But the diagnosis uh, was creating trouble. It was putting strain on school services. And there was also the suspicion that schools were not giving enough services to Asperger's kids. So what they decided to do was to eliminate Asperger's and, and create an autism spectrum on which people who might be diagnosed with Asperger's could be diagnosed with autism. Now maybe that's gonna happen, maybe it isn't, nobody knows, but one thing we do know is that removing the, the disorder takes away the identity of the people who have been identified that way. And what really was interesting to me was to discover that when the APA heard from the thousands of Asperger's people that they were worried about this, that they were upset about it, they were surprised. They had no idea that they were creating identities which is absolutely shocking. One of the interesting things about writing this book is, as I say, there's no scandal in it. I didn't have to get Freedom of Information Act stuff. You just listen to what they say and what they write, read what they write. They were surprised that a mental illness diagnosis would create an identity and that people would be upset about losing it. Not that it stopped them, I mean, it's gone. Uh, Asperger's disorder, RIP, May 22nd, <laughs> 2013. It's, how you cure things. It's how they cured homosexuality, <laughs> right? They got rid of it. Uh, and finally, I would mention the, um, the, the kerfuffle about the bereavement exclusion. The bereavement exclusion is a carve out in the major depression diagnosis by which people are, most people who are in mourning can meet the criteria for major depression. There's a surprise. Uh, when this was discovered, which was early on, by the people who made up the diagnosis in the 1970s, they realized this is a problem. It's a confidence problem. The whole DSM functions, and psychiatry in general, and my field too, everybody who's in the mental health field works on confidence. Our patients have to believe that we know what we're doing. And if you say a person who is in mourning is mentally ill, people aren't going to believe you. And so what they did was they created this carve out saying if you're ultimately what they said is within two months of a bereavement, if you have all the symptoms of major depression, you can't be diagnosed. Well, the problem with that, it's humane and it's, it sounds right, but the problem with it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, when Ptolemaic astronomy didn't work because planets turned out not to move in perfect circles, they created these things called epicycles so that the planet would be where it was supposed to be according to the circular theory, they created these little curlicues where it's theoretically the planet backed up on itself, but it did it in a circular pattern. That saved the theory at the expense of the truth. That's what the bereavement exclusion did. And scientists seized on that. And they said, well, wait a minute, why, why bereavement? Why not uh, unemployment, you know, foreclosure, divorce, all these other catastrophes? And of course, it turns out there's no reason. There is no difference. You can't show a difference between bereavement and other major traumas like that. And so they, they were forced with the decision, either go to a diagnostic system that takes into account people's real experience or get rid of the bereavement exclusion. Which one do you think they picked? They picked logical consistency over, I would call it common sense. And so now if you're within two weeks of a bereavement, if you're the, on the 15th day, instead of the 61st day, we've lost 46 days, uh, you can now be diagnosed with major depression. So these, these were the kinds of changes. But this is what's bound to happen when you have a diagnostic system that's entirely based in language. 
when you can't, as the head of the National Institute of Mental Health said a few weeks ago, when your diagnoses are reliable, we can all agree on what constitutes homosexuality, sort of. But <laughs> I, I, I don't want to you know, go too far on a limb with that one. But you know, roughly speaking. Um, but is that, does that mean just because a bunch of doctors can agree on what it is that it's a disease? Well, in the case of homosexuality, obviously not. How about in the case of major depressive disorder? The answer is no, because we expect diseases to have some kind of biochemical referent. And no psychiatric disorder does. And that's why they have these arguments. And they descend into absurdity. Uh, and ultimately, I have to say, after spending two years, although it was tiresome, I began to feel a little sorry for them. It's a really hard job that they have. Well, that gets uh, to something uh, very important. So there are these individual diagnoses that seem puzzling or uh, problematic. So they come in, they go out, depending on uh, which t t DSM it is. But beyond that, the uh, DSM-5 is now making claims that take them to a different level. And that's what they are. Um, th this claim, I I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, because that's really, that's such an important aspect of this. The cl which claim are you, are you thinking of, Phil? Uh, that, um, that they are going to find mm. um, specific um, biochemical um, the markers. The DSM-5 was born with an idea that it would be neuroscience that would underlie the DSM. This has been the dream of psychiatry for 130 years, ever since the discovery of germs. And it's not just psychiatry. It's all, it's all of medicine. The discovery of germs and the idea that it gave birth to, which is that suffering can be understood as a biochemical entity to be targeted with a drug and killed is such a powerful idea, and it's miraculous. People don't die from strep throat anymore. If your kid got strep throat in 1840, you could kiss him goodbye. If it turned into scarlet fever, they were done. That's what happened to Helen Keller. She didn't die, but you know, she was terribly deformed. So this idea that all of our suffering can be turned into this model is irresistible. Now, all of medicine has left this idea behind, at least in, in real life. There are so many diseases that don't meet that standard, but at least some medical diseases do. No psychiatric diseases do, and none ever have. The idea has been all along, if we observe the symptoms that cluster together carefully enough, we will be observing the, stuff, the, the symptoms of brain disorders that we will eventually find. That's been the promise. It not only hasn't been proved out, but to the extent that there is any understanding of these things, and it's not very much, it doesn't look right. It looks like using the DSM to, uh, using the DSM to map the, the brain is like using a map of the moon to get around Seattle. They don't go together. So when they announced this, that this was gonna happen, uh, it was fanciful that they were gonna change the paradigm. There was nothing to change it to. We're in the dark ages of brain chemistry, at this, of brain science at this point. And so what ended up happening was that they had to walk that back. And so then they said, OK, what we're going to do instead is we're going to come up with dimensions. We're going to find a way to measure the extent of mental illness and then find the threshold where health ends and illness begins. And that didn't work either. So in fact, the DSM-5, after all the screaming, isn't going to be that much different from the DSM-4. Let me, let me read another piece here uh, about this because I think that Phil's onto something that we need to talk about. One, one of the people you might have heard of in this whole mess is a fellow named Alan Francis. Alan Francis is sort of the, uh, we can't call him the hero. What can we call him? The anti-hero of my book? He's the, he's the tortured soul at the heart of my book, yes. although he denies that he's a tortured soul. And we had one heck of a relationship that Ben Nugent writing in Slate called a bromance, which I thought was just perfect. So Francis um, was, uh, was uh, the head of the DSM-IV. And when he saw this stuff happening, he became deeply alarmed. 
because he was the guy that led Asperger's and bipolar disorder two, which is the mild form of bipolar disorder that suddenly everybody had and was taking Abilify for, and other diagnostic epidemics had been kicked off by the DSM-4. So he said, look, you guys, you can't predict what's gonna happen. You have to be very conservative. And in fact, Francis had run a DSM-4. You never heard of it. You never saw the controversy. The book just came out and every therapist had to shell out the 100 bucks to buy it. But there were no controversies because Francis kept a real top-down lid on things. And when he saw that they were gonna open this thing wide, he got upset. Of course, what he did was he then drew attention to all the things he didn't want anybody to see. Um, and then got mad at me because I wrote about it. Um, and he's extremely angry with me today, and um, it's unfortunate. Anyway, in our first meeting, uh, we talked about this problem of mental, the definition of mental disorder. And we talked about how um, the, uh, the DSM seemed to grant psychiatrists dominion over the entire landscape of mental suffering a perch from which they could proclaim as a mental disorder any aberration that they could describe systematically. I asked Francis whether he thought a good definition of mental disorder would establish the bright boundary that would sort the sick from the unusual and thus keep psychiatry in its proper place, which is something he really wants to do, is keep psychiatry in its place. But he wants psychiatrists to keep psychiatry in its place. You know, the aristocracy should restrain itself as sort of noblesse oblige. Here's the problem, Francis said. There is no definition of a mental disorder. I mentioned that that hadn't stopped him from putting one into the DSM-4, or the people who were then making the DSM-5 from fiddling with it. And it's bullshit, he said. I mean, you can't define it. Now, he did come to regret having said that, uh, because I was writing an article for Wired Magazine, and it was the lead of the article. And he, he was pretty sore about it, especially, he said, because my use of his words might encourage mentally ill people to go off their medications. I had turned him into my Charlie McCarthy, he complained, not by putting words in his mouth, but by throwing my tone into his voice. Now, you know, he would have said something different if he'd really thought about it, but he didn't really think about it. And this is very interesting. You know, if we still believe in anything that Freud said, we have to believe that when people just say stuff spontaneously, it has a meaning. When they use a metaphor, it has a meaning. Um, and the, metaphors often have significance beyond their author's intent. Although, as Freud pointed out, sometimes analysis is required to ferret it out. Fortunately for us, there is a philosopher of bullshit. His name is Harry Frankfurt, and he's taught at Yale and Princeton. And in 2005, he published a tiny gem of a book called On Bullshit. Bullshit is unavoidable whenever circumstances require someone to talk about, to talk without knowing what he is talking about, writes Frankfurt. Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic exceed his knowledge of the facts relevant to that topic. Filling in the gap between opportunity and knowledge, that was the end of the quote. Filling in the gap between opportunity and knowledge requires the bullshitter to stand, as Frankfurt says, neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. His eye is not on the facts at all, as the eyes of the honest man and those of, of the liar are, except insofar as they may be pertinent to his interest in getting away with what he says. For the last 15 years, some of the smartest psychiatrists in the world, people who have studied diagnosis for their entire careers, people motivated at least in part by the desire to relieve suffering, have worked longer and harder and taken more fire than they ever expected as they revised the DSM-4. But if you ask any one of them, and I have asked many, about the DSM's diagnosis and criteria, new and old, he or she will tell you that they are only fictive placeholders or useful constructs. The best the profession can do with the knowledge and tools at hand. They are fully aware, in other words, that their opportunity, although they may call it an obligation, to name and describe our psychological suffering far exceeds their knowledge. They have intentionally, if unhappily, stood on the side of neither the true nor the false. And for the 60 years since the first DSM was published, they have gotten away with it. I don't mean to deny, to say that the DSM is nothing more than bullshit, or that the APA is only trying to hoodwink us in order to maintain its franchise, or make a buck or a hundred million of them, which is what the DSM-4 has earned it, that would be glib and uninteresting because finding bullshit in a professional guild's attempt to strengthen its market position would be no more remarkable than discovering gambling in Casablanca. But what are neither glib nor uninteresting are the circumstances that make it necessary and possible for the 150 men and women on the DSM-5 task force and work groups, these are the committees that make it up, to have it both ways, to manufacture fiction and yet act as if it were fact. 
If the story of the DSM-5 has any redeeming value, if it is more than a story about parochial disputes and internecine warfare, it is that it can reveal the conditions that motivate the publication of the DSM and the interests that a revision serves. Some of those circumstances are straightforward enough and depressingly banal. If fully 10% of your guild's revenue and an uncountable amount of your authority depend on a single book, a book that once saved your profession from oblivion and since then has brought it fabulous riches, you don't give it up easily. But other circumstances are less obvious and more dangerous. And the idea that gives psychiatry the power to name our pain in the first place, that the mind can be treated like the body, that it is no more or less than what the brain does, that it can be carved at its joints like a diseased liver. This is perhaps the most important idea of all. It reflects what is best about us, our desire to understand ourselves and one another, to use knowledge to relieve suffering, even if it results in a kind of reductionism that insults our sense of ourselves as unfathomably complex and even transcendent creatures. It also reflects what is worst, the desire to control, to manipulate, to turn others' vulnerabilities to our advantage. The first impulse demands a search for truth at all costs. The second makes it imperative to get away with whatever you can in order to exploit a market opportunity. When those impulses collide, commerce, and often bullshit, will prevail. So if uh, the DSM doesn't map what it claims to, uh, and although it may be helpful descriptively in certain ways, the, the overall claim um, is being called into question, then what do we think about therapy? What, how then can we um, go forward? Uh, well, when I'm promoted to king of the universe, Oh, that's going to happen. Can you do that for me? <laughs> uh, then what I would say is that the DSM, it, it is useful, especially for doctors to talk to each other. That's the original plan. There was a crisis in psychiatry in the 1970s. It turned out that if Dr. A said this patient is manic depressive, Dr. B would hear that, but they would not necessarily agree on what it meant. Or if they both saw the same patient, they might not agree on what the patient had. So there was a reason to try to create a common language. And originally that common language was gonna be created about 14 disorders. And then it was gonna be 22 disorders. And then they decided to go over to the descriptive method and the psychoanalysts had a shit fit. And, uh, or whatever psychoanalysts would call that. And <laughs> so the, the compromise position was, okay, you guys, whatever you want, you just tell us what you're treating and we'll make that into a mental disorder. And we ended up with 220 of them. So what's happened is that what might be at least a useful idea has gotten way out of hand. If the DSM were able to focus on those 14 or 22 severe mental illnesses that plague people, and if it were able somehow to take into account the extent to which even in those severe mental illnesses, what we have is a social problem, the social problem of homelessness, the social problem of people that don't fit in and so on, then I think psychiatry could focus its resources. Mm -hmm. But that leaves over the vast majority of consumers of mental health services. And in my opinion, we therapists and our clients and patients, we should not be in the healthcare system. The healthcare system has too much on its plate. We should work for what people can afford to pay us. Now, I realize that <laughs> I'm surprised. I, I thought that would get me ridden out of town on a rail. <laughs> Because what people can afford to pay us, I, I tell people, who, I really strongly, you know, when you say to them, yeah, you can use your insurance or I'll give you the paperwork, but first we have to diagnose you with a mental illness. That really, you know, <laughs> that really rains on their parade. They say, what? So, but I, and so how do you pay? Well, what's your car payment? That's a fair place to start. It's, it's worth your car, right? So. Sometimes people only drive a Kia and a beat up Kia at that. So the car payment's $150 a month and you know, that's still better than you make at uh, Walmart. So I think that there, sh there should be a re-bifurcation, mm -hmm. if there is such a word, of, <laughs> of therapy for medicine. This, this, they, we need a divorce. Mm. We therapists need a divorce and we need to resign ourselves to having less respect and making less money. And I think that won't solve all our problems, 
but that will solve quite a few of them. So then what, how do you conceive of what we would be doing? We would be doing what, we were, what you and I were trained to do and why we went into the business in the first place. We would be trained to help people face uh, themselves and, and the world that they live in and that we live in and to help understand, you know, the impetus of medicine, and God bless it, is to look at suffering and say, that's a problem, and I'm gonna try to get rid of it in any way I can. If you have cancer, I'm gonna burn it, I'm gonna poison it, I'm gonna cut it out, and you know what? Good, <laughs> right? I think. But, and, and, and by extension, that that suffering not only should leave the person's individual life, but that suffering should be eradicated from the planet, literally, smallpox is a huge success of, of medicine. Why? Because it's gone. The idea is that the suffering should leave. Well, when it comes to mental suffering, I'm not so sure that that's a good way to really go. Because mental suffering sometimes would be nice if it just left, and sometimes it's meaningless. Sometimes, it, uh, you know, I'm sure that brains malfunction the same way livers malfunction. But I don't know how often that's the case. Mm -hmm. And much worse than that, the people who are in charge of knowing it, they don't know it either. And so they've just assumed that it's every time, that it's always that's what's happening. Sometimes the suffering we have is meaningful and it needs to be understood. And that may sound, I don't know, sentimental or callous or I don't know what it sounds, but whatever it sounds, old fashioned, uh, it, I think it's true. And so what I would say is that that's what we would do. We would help people make something out of their suffering instead of seeing it as something to be uh, eliminated. Well, that would then lead us to think about suffering as having a different causes than just uh, the biochemistry of a person's brain. Sure. It might lead us to start thinking about the political um, terrain in which a person lives, um, thinking about uh, what is the good in human living. So then you're encouraging us to think about psychotherapy as moral discourse with political consequences. Are you suggesting this is gonna get me in trouble, Phil? <laughs> I, I, let, I, let me give I'm, you- I'm suggesting <laughs> the, chap the title of chapter nine of my book, which is called <laughs> Psychotherapy as Moral Discourse. <laughs> which, which, by the way, is unfortunately not here for Phil to sign and sell. Uh, uh, I do want to say something about that. I think that's absolutely right. And, and let's just think about a very specific example of that. We're all, you know, a lot of the people that are in therapy uh, are what, what we might call the walking wounded or the worried well. It all starts with W's, right? And I think sometimes if this society did a better job of providing health care, tuition, and retirement, I would have a lot less business. Hmm. There's an awful lot of uh, trouble out there that's directly related to those three items, and I'm just pulling those off the top of my head. Uh, and, and interestingly, those are the, the kinds of worries and stress that people experience as a result of those uh, problems is the kind that Prozac seems really well suited to treat. So, and, and by the way, so does cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, I don't wanna get in too much trouble here, but you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is not has become, you know, psychiatrists say, well, there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, but what's that? Uh, I mean, there's oh, everywhere, there's, there's value in, there, in the techniques, but it's ultimately an idea that your thinking can transform your world so that if it bothers you that you don't have a retirement being provided for you, you just change your attitude and it won't bother you anymore, as opposed to you go on strike yeah. or you go and you elect somebody who's going to help the government hold the government's fire, feet to the fire and say, we really need, or income inequality. There's another stressor that's just, you know, is my, do I really have to develop another a, a better attitude about that? Mm. Well, uh, you know, we, we should probably take questions, Phil. Yeah. I mean, we, we, could, we could do this all night, but uh, are, there, are there questions? What role, what are the outside stakeholders influence on this DSM, like the drug companies, mm. The, mm. The, the various industries that, uh, that profit benefit hugely from these diagnoses or lack thereof or, you know, the uh, mm -hmm. propagation that you guys must follow this and not throw it away? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good and interesting question because 
You know, one of the things that writing a book about this does is it makes you aware of just how much resentment there is out there about the DSM and about psychiatry. And part of that is that American sort of rejection of elitism. You know, who are you to tell me about? You know? But part of it is the result of a constant stream of bad news, like the story I told you about bi childhood bipolar. So a lot of people think, not unjustly, that the drug companies are driving this diagnostic proliferation. I actually don't think that's true. And I know that might sound surprising. But on the other hand, think about it this way. That would be a conspiracy. That would require a level of competence <laughs> that, no offense, but very few corporations have. And by the way, why bother? Who needs conspiracies when you have capitalism? You, you, don't, you don't need to go out to, the, it's not just capitalism. I mean, well, look, the APA throws up a diagnosis and the drug company slam dunks it. It's an alley-oop. But that doesn't mean they had to plan the whole thing. More to the point, the conflict of interest is intellectual. It's, it has to do with worldview. The people who make the diagnoses think about human suffering and human beings in the same way that the people who work at the drug companies do. And so they're, they don't have to, I mean, it's nice that they get paid, nice for them that they get paid, but they don't, the money isn't what does it. The money's just a symbol of their connection. Mm. Mm. They get paid not because they're gonna make diagnoses, they get paid because they see things the same way. And here's, here's an interesting point. The APA limited income to doctors on their committees to $10,000 uh, a year from drug companies. By the way, they thought that wasn't much money. That was, that was their, uh, the reason that came to, no more than 10 grand in income and no more than $50,000 in, in stock holdings, which, you know, it's chump change for uh, a lot of these guys. Well, what that did was it actually eliminated an awful lot of really smart people from the DSM committees. Hmm. Because the cream of the crop, such as it is, are the people who get the work for the drug companies. Because that's where the money is. Look, you're a psychiatrist, you're gonna make maybe a lousy $250,000 a year. Who could live on that? <laughs> so maybe only 200, because psychiatrists actually are one of the lower paying professions, uh, specialties. So if a drug company comes along and says, look, we'll give you an extra 50 grand, to supervise the study or to go around the country and convince people that you know, bipolar disorder should be treated with Risperidol uh, and will fund your $2 million a year think tank, uh, research institute, uh, you know, they, these are the guys that don't say no. Should they? Should it be a priesthood? I don't know. I mean, look, capitalism and healthcare, it's a bad combination. To turn suffering into a market, I mean, it's obscene, right? <clears throat> so I have a general question and then a more specific question that fits inside of it. So you didn't mention, we didn't talk at all about Axis 2, at least not in specific terms. Why don't you explain what Axis 2 oh, is? Oh, uh, the, the personality disorders. Ooh. <laughs> um, Axis 2. Uh, different axes. Of, I'll let you explain it. You're the professional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a rank amateur. I miss, actually um, missed that day. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Were you there that day? <laughs> but very specifically, there's been some controversy and some discussion around borderline personality disorder and whether that really doesn't belong in access to and whether it's really just complicated PTSD. So that is something I was very curious about hearing you speak about, but access to more generally and where that belongs in all of this controversy. Mm. Okay, well, access to, uh, well, the easy way to answer that question is, as of May 22nd, 2013, it won't exist. So when they first came up with the uh, DSM-3 in 1980, they decided to create a multi-axial diagnosis. Why they used the spatial metaphor, I've never understood, frankly. But axis one was everything, and axis two was personality disorders and mental retardation, and I think maybe that was it. Uh, and the idea was that one was sort of acute illnesses and the other was enduring. Do I have this right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> and, uh, and so there were, oh, you're, you're just bull****, aren't you? 
So yeah, yeah, whatever you say, man. Let me hang myself here. So if I remember right, there were 10 of them. Ten per so there were these personality disorders. You've heard of them, narcissistic personality, borderline personality, whatever, whatever. It was actually the last stand of the psychoanalysts. Yeah. The idea was that there are actually personalities out there, and you have one. <laughs> and it may be significant in your suffering, but it quickly fell into disrepute and disuse because the insurance companies wouldn't pay for treating access to disorders. They handed it to them. They gave them a reason to make a distinction. They said, oh, we're not going to treat those access to disorders because they're not real illnesses, whereas generalized anxiety disorder is. So uh, what they did with, uh, what they did with the, in the DSM-5 was they eliminated, eliminated the axes. They also tried to eliminate five of the personality disorders. And uh, this is a complicated story having to do with they're trying to create this dimensional system where instead of having categories, you have dimensions, which is actually closer to reality, right? We're all sort of narcissistic. We're all sort of borderline and whatever. So trying to find where one, where at the point at which it becomes illness. Um, and the personality disorders actually came closest to uh, creating that, uh, that system. However, the way they went about it uh, was messed up in ways that you'll have to read my book to find out, and good luck staying awake through that part. <laughs> and, uh, but the upshot of it was that it caused a mutiny among personality psychologists and researchers who rejected it out of hand as, a, as poorly constructed scientifically, more to the point. Eliminating narcissistic personality disorder, which was one of the proposals, was going to put a lot of people out of jobs because there's people who have made careers out of narcissistic personality. What happens if it goes away? So the, it's going to be pretty much the same way as it was in dsm 4 As to the question of whether or not a personality disorder like borderline is nothing other than PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder is the most interesting disorder in the DSM, in my opinion. It's the only one, the only important disorder that has a cause, the trauma that you're exposed to. I find this particular society really traumatic. I think that a lot of my suffering is the result of the stress that was imposed on me by my exposure to this trauma. What borderline personality disorder is, is a very focused version of the kind of trouble that people with PTSD have. So clearly there's a relationship. Is that going to be teased out in the DSM-5? Absolutely not. Well, but it's also a good example, the loss of um, access to is also a good example of um, a philosophical idea that uh, that if you try to if you claim you're bracketing off your prejudgments and uh, your work has nothing to do with uh, your moral understandings or your political commitments, all you're doing instead of bracketing them off is disguising them. So here we have a whole way of understanding humans that um, was very important in psychology and psychotherapy through um, psychoanalysis, as Gary said, that's getting eroded step by step. Uh, and the, then the only understanding of human being becomes more and more this kind of tinker toy approach to what a human being is. Hmm. Uh, what's more, that's what's a more good, up no, to that's date? Good, because molecules look like tinker toy, uh, you know, and that, it's, that's it's, right. it's a molecular understanding. So people are nothing except their behaviors, and the behaviors can be substituted in and out, uh, and you lose sense of the wholeness of a person and a sense of them as a personality. Um, the best example of this that I can think of was something I wrote about in um, 2002 uh, when I noticed that the DSM that I first learned about as an undergraduate at UCLA was, um, included sociopathy. You know, there were sociopathic uh, folks uh, in the DSM. Uh, and the examples of those kind of people were super salesmen, 
unscrupulous politicians, <laughs> CEO types, you know, big business people, people um, in, in those days pretty much, you know, all the examples were about men uh, anyway, and especially about sociopathy, that these were uh, young men who had been raised in affluent families, who had been trained, to, who'd been taught that anything they did could be, um, you could pretend that it, it, the bad things really didn't happen, that money or prestige would take care of it. And so uh, uh, these are, are people who uh, will be pretty um, uh, successful in American society, but the DSM at that time thought that they were, uh, the way they lived was a problem. So when um, DSM-4 came out, sociopathy uh, no longer existed. And what was in its place was something called antisocial personality. And in order to be diagnosed as an adult with antisocial personality disorder, you had to be diagnosed as a child with conduct disorder. Now, in our society, who often gets diagnosed conduct disorder? Is it rich white guys? No. It's people of color, people in the inner city, people who uh, are exposed to uh, enormous stress and uh, difficulty, and some of whom grow up in war zones. Um, so you see what's happened? The category got uh, criminalized. And this happened right at about the same time that uh, President Bush uh, took over um, the president of this country. You mean when the country started to be run by sociopaths? That's what you're talking about. <laughs> well, it got worse at that point. That's right. So this is a good example of how politics leaks into everything we do that's important to us, including thinking about uh, human suffering and psychotherapy.